Thanks so much for joining us today at Eastwood Tulsa, the place to believe, belong, and be loved. As you watch our live stream today, we invite you to join in and worship with us. Ask the Holy Spirit to speak to you through His Word and His presence. As you do, we believe that God will hear your prayer, meet you where you are, and do a powerful work in your life today. Once again, thanks for joining us. We take you now to our live service already in progress. All right. Thank you, Lucas. Appreciate you leading us in worship. Brother Jeremy will be back, the Lord willing, today sometime. He's coming back from Sweden, and he will be leading in our worship next week. I really love the series that we're doing now, and I hope you're getting a, an idea of what I'm trying to communicate as your pastor, the God you think you know, knowing God. And we, we started that last week. And today we sang a lot about God's holiness and about His perfection. He's perfect in all of His attributes. We've been looking at the attributes of God. And I've, I told you last week, but I've had a really great sense of the presence of God, His peace. When you think about what God is like, when you think about God knowing everything about everything instantly, knowing all the hairs on your head, being a holy God, being perfect, He doesn't grow in His knowledge, He's infinite in His knowledge. And he accepts us and receives us because of the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. And you just meditate on some of those things. For example, today we're going to look at his everlasting nature. He is, a, he is the everlasting God. And there's a key verse that we've been looking at. It's John 17, 3. This is it. Sometimes we think about eternal life as a destination where we're going to go. And it's true. If you put your trust in Jesus... If you receive Him as your Savior, one day you will be in His presence in a place that we call most often heaven. We will be in the presence of God. Notice what this verse says about what eternal life is. Eternal life is not just a destination. Eternal life is right now. If you receive Jesus, you have eternal life dwelling in you. This is eternal life, Jesus said, that they may know you, know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. That they might know you, get to know you. If you could spend, I ask this question often in my Bible study class on Sunday, if you could sit down and spend the afternoon with anybody in the world living, now I know you might want to spend it with Jesus, but someone that's not Jesus, who would you spend the afternoon with? I've asked students that question. I've asked adults that question. Some people say, well, my mom passed away. I'd love to spend an afternoon again with my mom or my dad. You really love your, your parents. But I'm talking about somebody that's living, somebody maybe that is very famous. You know, golfers might like to sit down and have an afternoon with Jack Nicklaus or those that play another sport, tennis, the Wimbledon finals are on now. I think Roger Federer is playing uh, Djokovic in the finals. So it'd be great if you're a tennis player to sit down and spend the afternoon with a tennis player. How about a president or a king or some movie star or actor? And God is saying, you can know me. You can sit down with me. You can open up your Bible in the morning and you can get to know me the eternal God, the everlasting God. That's our key verse. I'd like you to memorize that. I've learned that verse by memory. So eternal life is a person, God and His Son, Jesus Christ. That's what eternal life is. We get to know people by their names. And I must say, do you guys have a problem like I do? I met you, brother, and the drummer, thank you guys for coming, all the way from Oklahoma State, the real university, the real university, right down here, part of the Baptist Collegiate Ministry. All right, now, I, I, Mike, I remembered your name. I don't know why. Maybe it's a book of the Bible. That's why I remembered it. But I like to put a face with a name, right? Put a face with a name, a name with a face. But you can't do that with God because God is not as 
Lucas prayed in his prayer, he's like us and that we're made in his image, but he doesn't have physical body, arms and legs and eyes and ears. But the Bible talks about him as seeing and hearing and smelling and touching. He created us. You can know him. So what would you think if you were a very important person and you had an opportunity to come down with the people, you know, really come down out of your office or your throne or whatever, and you invited people to get to know you, and someone said, I've got other things to do. I'm going to check my Facebook feed. I'm going to check my Twitter account. I don't have time for the king of the universe. I think sometimes we miss the opportunities that we have to know God and to get to know him better because we're busy with all kinds of other things that really aren't that important. But we can't put a face with God. When we look at Jesus, we see what God is like. Jesus said, if you've seen me, what? If you've seen the Father. That doesn't mean that God looks like Jesus. It means that Jesus perfectly represents God. An attribute, this is a defini de definition, is something about God that's true as revealed in the Scriptures, the Bible. So when you read about what God is like, He's holy, holy, holy. We really focused on that in our worship today. He's also eternal. We talked about God being eternal. That's what we're going to look at today. When you think about the holiness of God or the knowing everything, He's omniscient. He knows everything simultaneously about everything that's happening in the universe from the time it was created until the time we are in the new heavens and the earth. Everything, He knows everything about everything. He knows all your problems. He knows all your tears, all your sorrows. The Bible says that the ancients would take tears and they would cry into a bottle. And then sometimes, I think the Egyptians would do this, they'd put those bottles in the tomb with their loved one or with the person that had died to show that they really, really were remembering their tears. Well, the Bible says your tears are in God's bottle. The Bible says your name is in his book. And the blood of Jesus cleanses you from all things. So when you're sitting around this week thinking about, does God really know me? Does he see me where I am? Out of all the seven point whatever billion people there are on the planet, he knows everybody. He knows what they're thinking. He knows what they're going to do. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere present in his universe. There's nowhere you can go where God is not. We're going to look at a little bit of that today too. So all of these attributes are something about God that is true as revealed in the Bible, as revealed in the Bible. In the Bible, the name for God is over and over again mentioned, Yahweh, over 6,000 times that name is spoken in the Bible, in the Old Testament. If you're reading the King James Version, it's L-O-R-D in capital letters. It was such a holy name, it was so set apart that the Jewish people would not even say it. They said Adonai. And I was listening to some of these scriptures, a rabbi reading the scripture in Hebrew, and he didn't say when it was Jehovah or Yahweh, he said Adonai. You couldn't write it because you might miswrite it. So they would often say Hashem or the name. Shem means name. Hashem means the name. It was such a holy name. It was such a revered name. God's name represents who he is. That's how we name our kids. How many are named Daniel here today? The E-L on the end of Daniel is the word for God. Michael, Daniel, Nathaniel, Ezekiel, all of those. How about Elijah? And, ben, and all those that end in J-A-H, that's the word Yah, which is the word for Jehovah or Yahweh. Names have meaning. Hey, if you haven't had a kid yet, don't name your baby by looking it up in a book and finding a name that's so strange that no one has it. Don't strap your kid with that name. L name your child something that you want to see in their character. Now, if you've already done that, 
that's okay. I'm not making fun of your baby's name. Pastor doesn't like my baby's name. He's a bad person. He's a bad guy. Our names mean something. Your name means something. And people were frequently named in the Old Testament because of something about their name. Their name represents their character. Like Isaac, laughter is associated with his birth. Sarah, when she was told she would have a baby, when she was almost 90, laughed at God. And it's funny in that story, God says, you laugh. Why did you laugh? And she said, I didn't laugh. He said, you did laugh. She said, I didn't laugh. You know, kind of arguing. And then when Isaac was born and she really did have that baby, she laughed again. Isaac's name means laughter. Isaac's name means laughter. And when one lady was having a baby because the Ark of the Covenant was captured by the Philistines and Eli had died, the priest that had judged Israel for 40 years, he fell over and died. When she was giving birth to her child, she died and she called his name Ichabod. Don't name your baby Ichabod. That means the glory has departed from Israel. And don't name your baby Sue. If you guys are older, you know the song, the old song, A Boy Named Sue. He got into a fight all the time because his name was Sue, Susan, and he was a guy. Name your child something that means something, a character quality, or who is like God, who is like Yahweh, Michael or Daniel, or one of those names, or a name, a girl's name that has great meaning in the Bible or something that you want someone to be like. Notice with me in Isaiah 40, something about our God. This is something that we need to recognize. God says through Isaiah, to whom will you liken me? Or what we would say is, what am I like? Or to whom shall I be equal, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these things who brings out their host by number, who brings out their host by number. The Bible says he calls them all by name. Speaking of the stars, by the greatness of his might and the strength of his power, not one of them is missing. Like we would say, where is whatever it is we're looking for? I have all the parts to the puzzle. I have all the stars named and counted. Now, I I receive great peace from that because if he knows all of that and he loves me and he does and he loves you and he does, then God can handle it, right? Sometimes you just need to say, handle it. And do you really need to tell him everything about everything that you want him to do? Sometimes it's good to, the Bible says, pour out your heart to the Lord. But it's like he knows He knows everything about everything. So trust him. Believe in him. Let it go. Let him have it. No one is like this God that we're worshiping. No one is like that. No one is like that God at all. Look at this verse in Psalm 33, verse 6. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. That means by his speaking word, Jesus. And all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. One pastor says, he breathes out stars. Psalm 33, verse 6. God created all of those, and he created you. Look at this verse in Psalm 147, 4. The Bible says, he counts the number of the stars, and he names them. He calls them by name. Arcturus, Orion, the Pleiades, Scorpio, all those constellations and all those stars in all those constellations. We're going to take a look at a graphic here of our universe. Uh, the lights are too, too bright, but that's the Milky Way galaxy. That's the Milky Way galaxy. And our Earth is somewhere up there in the top right in our sun, but you can't even hardly see it, can you? No, it's, it's unbelievable. It has billions of stars. Some say 100 billion. Some say 400 billion. God calls them all by name. And there are billions of galaxies like that in the universe. And if you were to be able to get on the Starship Enterprise or go warp whatever 
or you were to be in the Millennium Falcon, if you haven't watched Star Wars, I'm speaking another language, or Star Trek, you couldn't get there. This is 100,000 miles across, light years. 100,000, not miles, I misspoke, light years across. How far does light travel in one year? 5.88 trillion miles. So you have to multiply 5.88 trillion times 100,000, and you need to go that fast, 186,000 miles a second, every second, for 100,000 years just to drive across our subdivision. Now, when I think about that, it blows my mind, let alone if you could go at the speed of light, would you get to the end of the universe and there would be a big sign saying in English, this is the end of the universe you got there? No. What's on the other side of the sign? The universe is bigger than we could possibly imagine or describe. And the Bible says that God inhabits all of it. He inhabits eternity. He created all of it. Before anything was here, before that Milky Way galaxy, I like Milky Way candy bars. So every time I say Milky Way, you know, I'm thinking, Milky Way, I want a candy bar. You too, right? Yeah, me too. I'm thinking... Uh, candy bar. But this is, this is the God that we're worshiping. This is the God that you have a quiet time with in the morning, a devotional time. This is a God that you say, well, I don't really know what job to take. Do you think he knows what job you need? Do you think he knows what you're going to do before you? Of course he does. And he reveals that to you. That should give us great peace and great joy and great hope and great confidence that God's got this. If he's running the universe, if he's managing all the stars, can he not handle my life? Yeah, he can handle my life. He can do that. Now that creates some problems. I wrote in my note that gives us great comfort, but it also gives us some, some concern because if he knew that, then why did he let that happen? That's something for another message, not today. His foreknowledge of all the events that are going to happen. Can you change God's plan? Could Judas have not de uh, denied and, and uh, turned the Lord over for crucifixion? Could Judas have somehow not done that? The Bible says no. It was in God's plan. He was wicked. He made his choice. God knew that he would do that. Jesus chose him to be part of the band. He said, have I not chosen you, 12, and one of you is a demon, a devil? One of you is a bad guy? But Jesus used evil and suffering and pain to defeat evil and suffering and pain through his crucifixion on the cross. So knowing this also creates some problems for us humans because we're finite in our understanding. We're finite. We don't understand the infinite God. That's for another message. His all-knowing. I want you to look with me at Psalm 90, just so you get an idea today of some of the things that the Bible says about this God that we worship, Psalm 90. And in this psalm, there's a key phrase about God that I'm trying to bring out. Well, this is really hard to talk about God, how big he is, and how powerful he is, and really get our mind around this. But I would encourage you, every time you find something in the Bible that talks about God, what he's like, his power, his greatness, his glory, his holiness, underline it in your Bible and put it in your journal. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Notice this phrase. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth or the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. That's our word today. The everlasting God, the holy God, the eternal God, the everywhere present God, the God that knows everything about everything, the God knows what you're thinking, your secret thoughts, what you're going to do tomorrow before you even do it. You choose. He gives you the freedom to choose. But he also knows and controls every event in the universe. 
every tornado, every hurricane, every earthquake. The whole earth is groaning. The whole universe is out of whack. When Adam and Eve sinned, the whole universe went out of whack. Sin came into the universe. Sin came into the human race. Sin came into everything in this universe. And one day God's going to remake all of that. But before, look at it again, before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth of the, or the world, this sounds like birth language, giving birth to the world. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn man to destruction and say, Return, O children of men, for a thousand years and your sight are like yesterday when it is past. Underline the word like. It doesn't mean equal to. God created our earth in seven days, six days, and he rested on the seventh day. Those aren't thousands of year periods. They're days, evening and morning. Yom, the word for day in Hebrew. And before anything was created, before there was a sun and a moon or a stars or galaxies, God existed. He's never had a beginning and he's never had an end from everlasting. But I'm human. I'm created. Look, for a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it's past. They're like a watch in the night, four hour watch or whatever it was, six hour watch. They are like a flood. They're just carried away. You know how fast the flood is? You, we've had a lot of flooding in Louisiana now. They're like sleep. In the morning, they're like grass which grows up. And then in the evening, it flourishes and then it grows up. And then in the evening, it's cut down and withered. Been cutting a lot of grass lately? Yep. Now notice, for we have been consumed by your anger and by your wrath. We are terrified. You need to be terrified. The old translations used to say God was terrible. But when we, when we think about that, we think of, oh, that's terrible. It tastes terrible. And we say awesome today. It used to say in the, in the King James, it says God is awful. But you know what that sounds like. It's like you always say, boy, that, what does that mean? How can you have a sick shirt? Or that's cool is what my generation said. The Bible used to say God is awful. And we say awesome all the time. God is full of awe. He doesn't just have some awe. So the next time you say God is awesome, and then you say, man, that's an awesome t-shirt, think about what you're saying about God. Is God just like your t-shirt? Is he that awesome? No, he's full of awe. And if we were to be in his presence right now, we would just disintegrate. We would just disintegrate. We can't see him and live. Moses just got a glimpse of him, and he was like a hundred watt bulb. This is the word, you know I'm a language geek, this is the word in Hebrew, El Olam, and I want you guys to say it with me. It reads from right to left. We had a lot of trouble with that. We took a lot of time, because every time we put that in some sort of a media, it flipped the words. El is the word that's at the end of Michael, Daniel, Ezekiel, Nathaniel, our firstborn named Nathaniel. And the last word is Olam, and that's how it's pronounced. Let's everybody say, we worship, say it with me, El Olam. El Olam, the everlasting God. That's that phrase in Psalm 90. You might want to write that in your Bible. El Olam, he's the everlasting God. He is not created. So the question that kids ask, you know, who made God? Is easy to answer. It's profound, but it's easy. God was not made. God was not created. He's always existed. And tell your kids that. God does not have a beginning and does not have an end. I can't comprehend that because I'm finite. I look at things with time, successive moments of time. Some of you are doing that right now and saying, I wonder when he's going to finish. You know, when you have that thought, it just shows that you're finite and a bad person too when you're thinking, no, no, I'm just kidding. El Olam is the everlasting God. In Jewish thought, look at this. In Jewish thought, the numerous names of God revealed in Scripture... Elohim, Shaddai, El Shaddai, Elohim, Adonai, 
the king of Israel, etc. All of those names are thought to be revealing a specific or a different attribute of God's character and his will to us. The best website I've been on is Hebrew for Christians by John J. Parsons. That quote is from him. If you want to know about Jewish thought and as a Christian, it's one of the best websites I've, I've ever been on. So God revealing his names like that is showing us what he's like. You know, we say he's an honest person. He keeps his word. She's kind. She's gentle. He's an angry person. All of those things describe something about the person. And we get to know people that way. He always leaves the top off the toothpaste. See, when you get to know your wife or your husband after you get married, there are some things, what? That you don't like about them. Because you get to know them better. But as you get to know God, there may be some things that you don't understand and you can't comprehend. I read the Bible all the time and that happens to me. But you'll fall in love with him more and more and more and more. The name shows that God created time and he exists independent of time. Time doesn't affect him. He's not affected by time. He's outside of time and he's chosen to be within time by sending himself and the person of his son. So there's nowhere you can go in the creation where God is not. Nowhere. Look back at Psalm 90 again. Let's just look back there again. The Bible says in verse 8, you have set our iniquities before you. Look at this. Our secret sins in the light of your countenance. Does that trouble you that God knows everything that you've ever done? I'm going to tell you a story, but it doesn't really do justice to our God, but maybe it will give you an idea. Billy and Mary went to see their grandparents every summer, and they spent a couple of months of their summer break with their grandparents. They lived on a farm, and they had all kinds of chickens, and they had cattle, and they had land, and they had all the animals that you would find on a farm land. What's the song? Old McDonald. Yeah, I won't. I'll let you sing that, all right? And so there was one pet duck that they had. I think I've told this story, but a lot of you have never heard it. And Grandma said, don't throw stones in the barnyard because you might hit one of the animals. Of course, they got their eggs from their animals as well. Well, what happens when you say no more Oreos? One more. What, do you say, what happens when you say don't touch that? Wet paint, don't touch. What happens when you make a rule? Don't throw rocks in the barnyard. They threw rocks in the barnyard. Grandma's watching out the window. Grandma knows everything that's happening. You can't pull anything over on Grandma, right? I've got one of the, one of the grandkids here saying that's right. They know everything. Grandmas are everywhere just like God. That's why he made grandmas because, you know, he needs somebody everywhere, including him. So anyway, the, the boy threw the rock and hit the duck and killed it. Oh, yeah, it was a bad deal. So his sister said, I won't tell Grandma, but you got to make my bed every day until the end of the summer. She blackmailed him. Well, Grandma's watching out the window. She knows everything that's happening. Look in your Bible again at that verse, verse number eight. You have set our iniquities. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your countenance. God knows every sin that you've ever committed or will commit. Putting them in the light of his countenance means they're right before his face. Every time you do whatever it is you do when you're not walking in the Spirit or filled with the Spirit, God knows. God sees. Jesus paid for all of those sins. That's great news. His blood cleanses us from all sins. And one of the things the Bible says is God forgets our sins. He doesn't remember them. It's not that he doesn't know. It's not that he didn't know where Adam is when he said, Adam, where are you? He knew he was asking for Adam to come clean and say, yeah, I sinned. Because all of our sins, and grandma's looking out the window, and she knows what happened. 
and it's killing the kid. It's killing the young boy, not only because he has to make the bed every day, but because it's on his conscience. So finally he goes, Grandma, I threw the rock, I killed the duck. She said, I saw the whole thing. I knew, I knew it all along. I was just waiting for you to come clean. I was waiting for you to confess to me. God can love us and know everything about us, good, bad, worse, better. He knows how bad you are. He knows how good you are. And the Bible says there's none good, no, not one. But there is something about us made in his image that is good. Look at Psalm 90, a couple more verses, and then we'll move on. For all our days have passed away in your wrath. We finish our years. Here's another word for our lifetime. <sighs> That's how long our life is, like a sigh. The days of our lives are 70 years, and if by reason of strength they're 80 years, yet their boast is only labor and sorrow, for, as soon, we're, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. For who knows the power of your anger? For as the fear of you, so is your wrath. So what is the end of the, of the story? So teach us to number our days that we may get a, a heart of wisdom. We count our days. Some of you are young. You've, you've only got two digits in your name. Anybody here over 100 and have three today? Anybody in their 90s today? Raise your hand if you're in, in your 90s. Okay, you've got 10 years more than what the Bible says you should have. But even if you live for 90 or 100 or that one lady that's 113 or 112, we're going to end. But God has existed forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And if you've trusted in Jesus, you're going to live forever and ever and ever and ever and ever in a body that's going to be just like Jesus' body. That's amazing. So what does that mean for us? Let's, let's wrap this up today. What does that mean for us? I want you to look at some of these things with me. Well, first of all, let's look at the, let's look at the graphic of time. I love this. It's not mine. All right. This is the everlasting God. Now, I know that this is like we're in class, but take a look at that. God is at every point of every moment of every time since creation from eternity past going to the left or eternity future going to the right. God is looking at 2019 right now, but it's just as fresh as what happened at the creation of the world. He's there too. He's also there when Jesus comes again, our bodies are transformed in a twinkling of an eye in a moment and we have bodies just like Jesus. He was there at creation, that one little bar there at creation. He is already at the new heavens and the new earth. He knows the future. He knows everything about everything. That's El Olam. As much as we can comprehend about that. So he knows everything about the, the 70, 80, 90, or 100 years that we have, or 50, or 40, or a miscarriage, which we had in our family. He knows all about those things. And he loves us, and he cares for us just the same. That's our graphic. Look at this verse, Jeremiah 23, 23. He says, am I a God near at hand? says the Lord, and not a God far off. He's both. Can anyone hide himself in secret places so I shall not see him, says the Lord? Do I not fill heaven and earth? Those are the kind of things you need to meditate on. Those are the things you need to think about God and get your mind to really be blown and your peace to be like a river, like the Bible says. Do you really know that God? Is that really the God that I'm speaking to right now? Nothing's impossible for God, except for him to change his nature. He can't do that. For him to remember your sins once they've been covered by the blood of Jesus, he chooses to not remember them anymore in your time frame. He doesn't remember them. There's no angel, there's no hard disk, there's no big terabyte drive with all your sins on it. They're all gone. God cannot be contained by the universe he created, and he dwells in an unseen place that you can't get to right now. That's where he is. He's here with us, and he's far away. 
He dwells in an unapproachable light where there's glory and holy, 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 and where everybody falls down on their face. And it's going on right now in the place where he dwells, but he's also in this place right now. That's his omnipresence, which we'll talk about a little bit more. But we need to connect God with Jesus. Here's where the Bible does that. Look with me at the book of Colossians and connect with this. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. He's the firstborn over all creation, meaning he has first place. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth. Jesus is the creative power word of God made flesh. Everything that's visible that you can see, he made. Everything that's invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, think of angels and demons. Think of the power structure of our universe, all the laws, everything he created. All things were created through Jesus and for Jesus. And he is before all things. Jesus said to the Pharisees, before Abraham was, what did he say? I am. I am means I am. It's a word which means I will be what I will be. It's a verb. That's what God told Moses to tell them his name was. I am. I exist. Everything that we have and know owes its existence to God himself. So what does that mean for me? Look at, look at just a few things. How do we respond to that as we go out? Well, I need to be humble. I need to be humble. If talking about that doesn't humble you, if you think when you get to heaven you're going to be walking around like this, look at me. Look at me. There are no mirrors in heaven. You're not going to be going, man, look at that body I got. Look at that six-pack. You know, look at those abs. No, we're going to be looking at the glory of God. It's going to blow our mind. We need to be humble. I need to be humble. Thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with whom? What does the Bible say? With him who is contrite and humble of spirit. Contrite means repentant. To revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. God wants to lift you up, build you up, but you've got to come to him in humility. You can't strut before this God. It's not your legs or your power or your beauty. It's your humility. I've I've got to be humble. Secondly, I've got to trust him. Here's what Psalm 18 says. Psalm 18 says, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength. Look at all those mys. In whom I will trust. My shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. Trust in the Lord today. Whatever you're going through, whatever I'm going through, whatever problem you have, can it be that God, God never is surprised? Did you know that? That's another characteristic. He's never surprised. He never says, I didn't know that. Wow, you're kidding. Sometimes we tell him what to do with our prayers. We need to come to him humbly and say, Lord, what do you see? What do you see? You're my shield. You're my stronghold. You're my fortress. Thirdly, you're never alone. You're never alone. Here's what Jesus said. Indeed, the hour is coming before his crucifixion. He said, yes, has now come when you you will be scattered each to his own. And notice what Jesus says. And you will leave me alone. And will leave me alone. And then Jesus hastens to say, Yet I'm not alone because the Father is with me. Is the Father with you right now? Is he with you? Yes. That everlasting God that the universe can't contain is with you. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is with you. You're never alone. Have a problem with loneliness? You're not alone. You can't be. God will never leave you. Or forsake you. He's near to the brokenhearted. So if your heart is broken, he's not far away, he's near. Jesus said this right before he ascended. He said, I'm with you always, even to the end 
of the age. I'm always with you. I'll never leave you. We want our boyfriend or our girlfriend or our husband and our wife to do what only God can do, or our parents. Your parents can't be with you every moment of every day. God can. God does. And then lastly, as we get ready for our invitation, you can be saved today. I can be saved today if I'm not. There's no distinction in this congregation today between the Jew and the Greek, the rich and the poor, the slave or the free. The, the same Lord is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You know, you know enough to be saved today from your sins. Call upon that name of the Lord. And that everlasting God that dwells in that place, the Bible says, He hears your prayer. I can't figure that out. But He hears your cry. Stand with me as we get ready to respond to Him. This God, in this neighborhood, this galaxy, God sees me and knows me. Let me pray for us as we get ready for our invitation. Hey, thank you for joining us today. We are so glad that you chose to worship with us. And we pray that you have sensed God's presence in this service and that he has spoken to you through his word. No matter where you're at in your relationship with God, we want you to know that he loves you. Maybe you're in a growing relationship with him and that is awesome. But maybe today you have been away from God and you really sense him drawing you back to himself. Maybe today you're ready to begin that relationship with Him. Will you pray with me today? Father God, we believe that Jesus is your Son and that He came to take our sin away. Lord, we trust you. What Jesus did is enough for us. So we ask you to forgive us of our sin, come into our lives, and begin to change us. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. We would love to hear about your decision today. So if you'd click the Help and Hope button right here on this page, or simply email us at eastwood at eastwoodtulsa.org. We're gonna pray with you, and we're gonna partner with you in this journey as you become all that God has created you to be. Once again, God bless you, and thank you for joining us.